Hello, welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have something yet again a little different than normal for you. I have Andre Simone, President and CEO of Finica Impact Finance. Finica Impact Finance has been around since 1984 and has been issuing microloans around the world that currently total well over $800 million. The reason they make an ideal candidate for a show about fintech is that they have leveraged technology in order to expedite their underwriting and issuance process in some of the most unconnected and challenging environments around the world. And with that, here's my interview with Andre. Hello, Andre. Hi, Jason. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you for taking the time today. Yeah, I'm super excited. Andre Simone of Finca Impact Finance. Tell us about Finca Impact Finance. I am so happy to talk about the work that we do. So Finca operates across 20 countries, some of the most challenging economic and even, I would say, political and naturally challenging markets in the world. And we provide responsible financial services to people who have limited or no access to traditional financial services, which allows them to in turn invest in their very small businesses and create financial health for their families. Excellent. So uh, noble cause, uh, to say the least. So let's, um, let's talk about the history. So what's the origin of Finca and your involvement? So Finca actually started over 35 years ago. There were a couple of guys who got together and had this epiphany that what poor people were actually lacking in, in most of the developing world and was not the desire or the acumen to start businesses, but they just lacked the capital to put into those businesses to be successful. And they tried an experiment down in Central America where they essentially went out into the countryside and just gave people money and told them that they would need to come back and pay it back with interest at the end of the experiment. And what they learned through that was that actually those people were very reliable because they didn't have access to any other resources. They wanted to stay in good standing. They really wanted to have access to additional resources. And so they started replicating this in many countries around the world had lots of support. Microfinance was really booming at that time. And the results were pretty incredible. You know, the, the default rate in most of these very, very small loans historically has been incredibly low. Um, so around 3% portfolio not coming back at the end of a period, which is extraordinary when you compare it to traditional commercial retail banking. Is there any reason that comes to mind as to why that default rate is so low? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that the absence of choice actually is part of it, that people, the alternative in terms of the financial services that they could access is either non-existent or really prohibitively expensive through loan sharks. And so people wanted to make sure that they continued to have access to that. I think that's part one. Part two is that a lot of our banking historically, but even still today, focuses on communities. And in the context of communities, it's very different. You know, here in the United States and in Europe, we're very accustomed to people making financial decisions almost in isolation without their neighbors and their friends and their families really having full knowledge of what they're doing. But in the communities that we're working in, a lot of this was built around this concept of solidarity guarantees and people supporting each other and taking loans. And that drove a lot of really positive behaviors. It helped in terms of people coaching each other because they wanted to make sure that their neighbor didn't default so they wouldn't be responsible for it. It helped in terms of consumption discipline. So I think that's a really good takeaway for all of us who are now driving forward with the digital side and, and the fintech side of this is how do you maintain that sense of community and accountability even when you're operating in a digital context? So interesting. It was a combination of the fact that there the entire community is on the hook and they really don't want to kill the goose to lay the golden egg because frankly, the exactly. But it's interesting. And you know, you talk about the success rate of these things. It reminds me of something called Liebig's Law, which basically says that a typically means it's around plants, but that essentially growth is limited by the least available input required, right? Uh -huh. and, you know, again, it's not the input of, of effort or intelligence or desire. It's the input of capital. And exactly. you know, the, the hurdles on the, in some of these countries are so astonishing. So being a technology-focused podcast, let's start with how, and there's a lot of things I want to ask about beyond this, but let's talk about how you've been leveraging technology within this uh, organization to better meet your mission. 
Great. So maybe I actually should start off by talking a little bit about the traditional business model that we have, because that's sort of the baseline that we're coming from. So we have over 10,000 employees around the world, and most of our employees are frontline interacting with our clients all the time. Um, Historically, the niche that microfinance has operated has been in remote rural areas where commercial banks don't want to invest in building branches and people simply don't have access. And it's been a combination of word of mouth, working in marketplaces, and just really, you know, boots on the ground, people going out to meet the client. And so that was the context that we operated in for a really long time. It's a hugely labor-intensive business model, one that doesn't lend itself necessarily to, you know, scaling very rapidly. And so when fintech started to come into the space and we started to look around at a lot of the technology that was available, we got really excited about what we could possibly do to really make this access question almost go away. And so we started off with relatively, I would say, simple things like using tablets to replace all of the paperwork that goes through our system because people were, as you can imagine, going out to meet with clients, filling out a ton of paperwork, taking a a motorcycle two hours back to the office, data entering everything, and then maybe things were missing. So they were have to take another two hour motorbike ride back to the client to collect additional information. And now we have the ability in Tanzania, for example, to meet with a client in their business, take all of the information that's necessary, avoid missing information because we've got these smart tablets that can alert us to when the data is incomplete. And we have a direct tie to the credit bureau. We have a direct tie to the national ID so we can do all of our KYC assessment and collect the right information there and then make a credit decision right there on the spot um, for small loans. And as you can imagine, for us, that was a radical transformation. I think for a, a lot of big institutions that have integrated technology all along the way and have deeper pockets than us, Um, That may not be such a big change, but the way that we applied it in terms of continuing to go out and serve our clients in those remote areas is different, and it's been really exciting. And then on top of that, we started to say, okay, well, most of our clients have phones. They may not be smartphones. The majority of our clients are still using dumb phones or USSD phones, but if they can access their bank account information and make transactions happen from their business or their village, instead of having to take a bus for an hour to go to the closest branch and wait in that branch for 30 minutes in order to affect a very small transaction, that's a win for us and it's a win for them. So we've been partnering with mobile network operators to stand that up. We've got fantastic relationships now just with, to name a few, with Vodacom and Halitel and others that are allowing us to offer those services. And I think that that's the biggest promise. So then I think the next question becomes, what are the challenges? associated with getting that technology in place besides just the internal knowledge and the fact that we are resource constrained because we are not a purely commercial profit-driven institution and we're looking for that social impact. So we do have a lower return than, uh, say, a pure commercial player. And I think that what we found actually is that in many respects, from the technology side, we are almost more agile than the other large traditional institutions because we don't have such a, a, I would say, rigid banking history. And we've come out of this interesting hybrid model of social impact and financial performance. And that's actually enabled us to kind of start testing things a lot more quickly and identify what's working and not working for the clients. But I will say, I and my team have certainly learned a lot of hard lessons <laughs> over the last couple of years in making mistakes in this new space. So I'll say this much. First of all, the fact that you have fully integrated and paperwork document KYC clarification, and I don't, speaks volumes to just yeah. how much faster you can move. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find it astonishing. So basically, yeah, I mean, you digitize the entire experience. Basically, I've, I've done all the stuff that are, is best practices and happening in the for-profit world. Just one comment about the impact space, because I do have several friends heavily involved in this, and so I had some involvement in it myself. You mentioned the lower returns, but I mean, it's interesting. And I, I guess I see it here from the people interested in that space who inquire about it. You know, yeah. someone's willing to give up one or two points on a long-term return if it also means 
having this kind of impact on the world. So, and we're just actually recording this shortly after a number of prominent CEOs in America came forth and said, sorry, we reject Milton Friedman's doctrine that the only thing we should be worried about is profit. We need to worry about being stewards. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like it's maybe that was the focus before and maybe that's what my industry unfortunately focuses on far too much. And I, we do because the number of clients who come in here and say, we're looking, we're interested in social responsible investing. I say, great, let's talk about it. And they say, wow, every other advisor tried to talk me out of it. Our, we got we to start, start accepting the fact that the most important thing to clients, return matters but it's only part of what matters to them. Yeah, listen, uh, well, you're preaching to the choir on that <laughs> one. I think return does matter. And return matters fundamentally because we do not want to have an unsustainable business. There are still you know, 1.7 billion people out there who need access to financial services. And so you have to be sustainable. It has to be a business model that really does have legs and can work. Having said that, there's a lot of financial services out there where people have almost 100% access, but the net impact in terms of people's financial health has been actually pretty negative. Yeah. And I'm not interested in doing that. And my team is not interested in doing that. We are sitting here in this challenging space with our clients because we want to build a better boat. And I think that's the lifelong struggle <laughs> that we've embraced, why I've been at Finca as long as I have and why I'm so excited about where we are today. And I think that there are investors out there who want to be alongside us and who are willing to take the risk. And the risk is substantial. It's not just, honestly, the, the business risk itself is relatively limited. I was talking to you about the repayment quality. The repayment quality as a general rule is really high. The risk comes from political exogenous shocks or mm -hmm. massive devaluations or hurricanes and earthquakes that wipe out entire segments of borrowers who just don't have the resilience to be able to sustain their businesses and during those kinds of crises. And so that's really where I think we need partner investors who have a super long view on the benefit that we're creating. And if you can, we had a really great partnership actually that came out of a disaster with one of our subsidiaries where we had a massive devaluation and people that we were working with, our lenders were, took the long view of the repayment and we knew that people fundamentally wanted to pay us back, but that they just weren't able to do, that, do so in that moment of time. And I, and I think that's the balance is really understanding the individual client and where that individual client is. And coming back to that question of the digital side, I think that's, that is one of the fundamental risks. We're getting so much more accurate in our scoring, right? And so we can look at people's capacity to service their debt, but it's very difficult to account for those shocks that hit developed economies or developing economies disproportionately. So in that moment, what's your position going to be as an institution? Are you going to go long or you're going to say this is a disaster and, and we've got to get out? And I think it's really the people with the long view that ultimately have the greatest impact on development and really contribute the most to building the financial system that can have that resilience over time. Absolutely. So can you talk to me about how, and I'm not sure if it has, but how basically technology has changed the way you underwrite these loans? I've heard of, yeah. I've read of many cases of you know African lenders using data from cell phones to help the score people. Yep. We've done thus far. Yeah, so we have. We've actually scoring has has been something that we've been really exploring for I'd say the last three or four years. We've done some experiments with psychometric scoring, both in Africa but also in Guatemala which have been very useful in terms of helping us to establish the client's real accountability towards the institution and their fundamental desire to have a strong relationship. But we've also used, yeah, cell phone data. And you actually are able to make a nano loan, you know, that very small loan off, off the, the basis of pretty little information, just tracking the payments that are going through people's cell phone accounts. And several of our partnerships with mobile network operators use that model. I will say though that a lot of that, those very, very small nano loans that are getting made, they have very little contact with the client. And as a result of 
that we're seeing the consultative group to assist the poorest. I don't know if you know CGAP, that's part of the World Bank group, but CGAP did a study and they were showing that in Kenya, but also in Tanzania, that there are fairly high levels of over indebtedness in that particular segment because it's straight consumer debt that people can get relatively easily and don't necessarily fully understand the implications of. And they get blacklisted for borrowing as little as $10 and not repaying it. And then they can't borrow again for a long time. So I think that we have to be very attuned to that risk that we're creating as we score. Yes, you can make a faster credit decision, but I don't necessarily believe we're not at the stage where big data can really inform the full picture of the potential relationship with an individual. We don't have that kind of data pool that's easy to access. Uh, Certainly we don't as an institution, but I would venture to say most people who are operating in, let's say, in Africa don't. So what do you really use to anchor that sense of community and accountability. And I think that there, it's really important to continue to have that frontline relationship with the client so that you don't make people more vulnerable and actually put them in a situation where they've borrowed money because you made it too easy for them to create a problem for themselves. Yeah. And it's interesting. It's, uh, I had a conversation with a previous guest of the show just, uh, just the other day. And he was talking about how the data they've collected has now reached a certain point where the scale is making it informative. And they're able to, uh, yeah. through machine learning, actually discern incredible amounts of data so much that people who are supplying them with content are now coming them to them for insight and are paying the other way. So they kind of flipped the model just because they are able to do it. Now, given the excess of data in developed markets in North America, I see that being no problem. Given the access to data where you operate, I am staggered by just (laughs) how difficult that must be. And even even the successful stories I've heard where, you know, again, scan the behavior on a cell phone, you can get a lot of data points from that, but that's a small microcosm of that person's life. And everything else they do is leaving no digital trails. So yeah, I can it's an incredible challenge. So I think your hybrid approach for lack of a better term, is probably the way to go for now. I think so. And I think that there are two really fundamental driving factors in all of this, which is one, we operate in economies where cash is still king. So, you know, less than 50% of transactions are going to be done in over mobile at the moment. That's one. And then two is the cost of data is actually really high. So people are not, they're not living in a fully digitized economy. They still need to have access to cash. And I think, honestly, we have to be ready for that jump because it is going to come. But for us, it's about how do we build a pathway, not just for us as an institution, but also for our clients to bring them to that digital economy. And so in some respects, a traditional commercial institution might look at us and say, wow, they're moving very slowly. But we've been talking a lot with our clients. And what our clients are telling us is we really want to make sure that we can get cash in and out of the system really quickly. And so digital is great for certain things for us today. But in the absence of an ATM network and in the absence of bank branches, mobile is not the answer unless you have something like agent banking, which we're investing a lot in right now, where the client can walk across the street and pull out their $5 that they need in order to take that to make the cash payment that they have to make. Yeah. And I mean, that presents its own challenges too. I mean, you know, we're talking about countries where we take this incredibly for granted, where the power can go out several times a day, right? Like this is, you know, you have that challenge. And then on top of that, you know, those ATMs, even if they're there, some of the fees charged in some of these markets are just exorbitant. Are ridiculous. Yeah. Or the ATM's empty. (laughs) Or the ATM's empty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, I I get it because some of these, some of these countries use, you know, cash withdrawals as de facto taxes because of the lack of reported currency on the market, right? So you have to get creative about how you collect tax revenue. But these are all hurdles that... (laughs) have to face on a daily basis that none of us ever think about. So tell me about where you think the implementation of future technologies is going to take this and what kind of technologies are exciting you right now in terms of where, how they're going to evolve what you're working on. Well, I am so excited about even some of the basic AI that we can implement and we're already starting to pilot to communicate with our clients. I think that one of the challenges is always how do you create a dialogue with your client around around their use of financial services. And again, for us, 
the impediment to reaching out to more people who need access has been that we've got to have lots of people working for us and that can go out and do that. And now it's not there yet, but we do know that, you know, again, the vast majority of our clients have those USSD phones. And so we are able to communicate with them more and more about how they're using their products. And that's really exciting to me because I think, again, we take for granted here the access that we have to a lot of financial tools that actually help to inform the decisions that we're making, you know, the kind of the mint and the credit karmas and even the acorns of the world that allow you to take advantage of all of this luxury of financial services that we have here. Most of our clients get very rudimentary education, but they're really smart people. So the idea that we can communicate with them using AI in a way that is most appealing to them, that will allow them to get the information that they want when they really want it, and to learn from that about how we can support them better, I find that incredibly inspiring. And I've actually been talking with a whole host of people. We have colleagues at Action who are working on a a financial health tool. We have people at, at MetLife that are contributing to working on a financial health tool. I've been talking to folks at IBM about their AI uh, capabilities because this is our moment actually to use technology relatively inexpensively to help people do better. Absolutely. Excellent. So not just give them the money, but also educate them on how to best use the money and how to how to understand just the simple things that we take for granted. I mean, even developed markets, financial yeah. literacy is abysmal, shockingly bad. And I can't imagine you know, throwing, and this is you use the example of someone borrowing 10 bucks and then being blacklisted. I mean, did they even contemplate that as a repercussions when they decided no. to borrow that 10 bucks, right? And now they're, they've got that scarlet letter on them, unfortunately. So that being said, before we wrap up, I have three kind of questions I ask, kind of blue sky ones that make you think. The first one is okay. one wish for something you could change in what you're doing in your job in the, in the marketplace. What would it be? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that stops everybody. <laughs> if I had one wish, it would be to have a magical advisor that could sit with me and my team and help us to figure out exactly what technology investments we should be making and when. And it's just so hard right now because it's moving so quickly Mm -hmm. and it's super exciting, but we can no longer afford to make these massive infrastructure investments that take years and years to implement because tomorrow it's going to be different. So I would love to have a magic eight ball for the technology that says this is where it's going to end up. Short of that, I'm actually working with one of my board members who is an IT expert to pull together a group of advisors that we can talk to on a regular basis about the trends that they see emerging in the marketplace. And we've stood up a really cool innovation platform that we're using to do proof of concepts with small fintech companies who have innovative ideas. And that's kind of what we're doing, but the Magic 8 Ball would be really cool. Yeah, what I mean, what you just said is something that's confronting every large institution. The reality is, is that especially when you get to a certain scale, the implementation of these strategies is not cheap. And you can't really afford to be an early adopter or even a fast follower in this marketplace. It's just the, the yep. cost of having to pivot is is just enormous. But yep. yes, good. You know, the fact that you guys are contemplating that and, and looking at that, good, it's fantastic. So second question, what's been the biggest challenge you've faced in getting to the point where you guys are now? Changing people's minds. The biggest challenge is always change management. And technology is not the problem. And the products and the clients are not the problem. The problem is really in a large institution like we have, where people have a real commitment to this social impact. We've been doing things the same way for a really, really long time. And when you make a fundamental change to how you operate your business, like for example, introducing tablets, you have to have the strongest change management around that because you're changing people's jobs. You're changing the way that they relate to their clients. And you can't just launch it out there into the field and say, okay, now do this because it will not work. And we've learned that very much the hard way. So I think that the change management is the overarching thing for all of us. And, you know, you can't ever stop doing it. (laughs) And I think that for me, honestly, was a harsh personal lesson where with my team, we started talking about a lot of the transformation that we needed to do several years ago, even. And I thought, okay, well, everybody's got that now. We can focus on execution. 
but the truth is that you've always got to be paying very close attention to how you're encouraging change and, and how people are adapting and where they're missing information that will help them make that change faster and where you're incentivizing them to make that change faster. So I think for me, that, that is the biggest challenge. Also, honestly, one of the biggest joys because when you bring people along and you're all running in the same direction, it's really exciting. But you've got to keep on laying the rails out there in front and encouraging everybody to go down the path and helping them to see why fundamentally it's better for the clients, it's better for them, and it's better for the world. Great. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's uh, <laughs> I would actually caution to say that the best way to handle that is unfortunately who you hire. There are people with a change yeah. mindset and there are people who will not budge and want things to be the way. <laughs> and frankly, there's no dealing with that. And I say that from a industry that is notorious for not changing and uh, yeah. giving speeches to advisors <laughs> who basically say they want to fix it and then look at me with light eyed and say, yeah, I'm going to keep going with them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's, that, that's yeah. one of my wishes. I wish everybody would have a change mindset. <laughs> anyway, the last part is, and this is, I'm guessing, self, almost self-explanatory. What excites you the most about what you're working on, what you do? Like, what gets you out of bed every morning to keep doing what you do? And normally, for the record, I'm going to preface this by saying that most people do not have, uh, the interview do not have positions as benevolent as yours. So it's a little right. easier for you to answer <laughs> Yeah, I do have an ace in that one. Yeah, look, I knew pretty early on in my life, um, despite my focus on finance and financial services, that I wanted to leave a legacy behind that was going to make the world better. And I work with a group of like-minded individuals who believe very much in commercial principles, but really want to contribute to people's financial health, because we believe fundamentally that that will create not just prosperity, but also more stable societies that are more equal and where people have access to education and better health. So yeah, it's pretty motivating to get out of bed in the morning every day. Um, we have lots of challenges that we face, not the least of which is figuring out which technologies we implement next. But it is whenever you meet with a client and they take your hand and they explain to you that because of the loan that they received from us or the financial support that they received from us, they have been able to send their daughter to school and she now has a job in an office and she's the first member of the family to have that or that they were able to buy medicine that they couldn't buy before or that they built their first house it makes you feel pretty darn good about what you do. Yeah, I have to say with you, <laughs> no matter if you, even if you have a bad day, the uh, the, the <laughs> one thing that's going to make you feel good is right around the corner with you, isn't it? Yep, pretty yeah. much. Anyway, Andre, thank you. This has been fantastic. So it's been different, but it's also been incredibly positive. It's nice to see the impact that this sort of stuff is having, that the technology is having on enabling people to better their situations around the world. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much, Jason. It was really a pleasure to speak with you. So I hope you enjoyed that review with Andre Simon, and I hope you enjoyed seeing how technology and fintech can actually be used to improve people's lives around the world. And as always, I am Jason Pereira, and this has been Fintech Impact. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.